thank you because we've come to your presence. It's a time of joy. You have said where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in their midst. That's what constitutes a church. And here we are more than 10, we are more than 20 gathered together, even though virtually, but we are gathered together, worshiping together. And we know that you are here. Let your spirit take control of this meeting. Okay. Breathe upon your people. Okay. Let the power of your renewal and resurrection, let it come upon every soul and quicken our spirits by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes of understanding. Amen. Thank you because we know you answered. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 For those who were not around last week, let me just uh, make a little bit of uh, recap. Last week we started because I said that we want to look at a series on church planting, especially starting new churches. And last week we looked at seeing beyond the little cloud. And I looked at the scriptures from 1 Kings chapter 18. Elijah went to pray because God had told Elijah that go and show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain. And God showed himself, I mean, and uh, Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. He cleaned up the situation. And then it was now time for God to send rain. Elijah went to pray. He prayed the first time. He told his servant, go and look and check whether there's any sign rain is coming. The servant went and came back and said, I see no rain. Elijah said, go the, the second time. He went, he came back, I see no rain. Go the third time, he went, I see no rain. Fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. The Bible says, by the time he came back the seventh time, he told Elijah, I see something little. I see a little cloud, the size of a man's hand. And you can see how big a man's hand is, very small. Elijah said, don't worry. That's all we need. The little cloud is a little clue. Remember what we said? It was a little cloud that preceded the great rain. It was a little cloud that precipitated a great rain. It was, the little cloud was a little clue telling us a great rain is coming. The Bible says, in the meanwhile, the heavens was black with clouds. Initially, the man saw a little cloud. But later, the Bible talks about clouds in the plural and wind. And what followed? Great rain. The little cloud, great rain. A little clue, great abundance is coming. Amen. Despise the day of small beginnings. If I give you one seed of corn, you can look at it. Even this seed of corn, if I throw it on the ground and a, you know, a, a, a chick or a hen eats it, it can't, it can't even satisfy. Can it? No. But if you take that little, little seed of corn, you put it in the ground. You don't allow an hen or a chick to eat it. After six months, the husks that it will produce, each husk might take, might have 100, 200 on it. And you have about four. Before you know it, you have about 500, 1,000. That little corn that cannot even feed a fowl is a seed. There's an harvest inside it. It's a little clue of the possibility of harvest in the future. The Bible says a little one will become a strong, a great nation. The Bible says even though your beginning was small, your later end will greatly increase. It's always so in God's program. So you must see beyond the little cloud. And that's what we wanted to show you, yes, I mean, last week. I don't see yourself as only one. Don't worry. 
You are only two where you are. It's not relevant. You are only three where you are. It's not relevant. Let me give you my own story. I said it a little bit last week. 1988, September. I got to Manchester. And I was the only person. I couldn't find any deeper life individual around me. None. I was the only one. There was not the only church that deeper life had was one church in London. One church, St. Butters in London. Small congregation. That was all. And then I came to come and do my PhD in Manchester, and I was the only one. And there was no internet at that time. So on Sunday, I would go to a church called New Testament Church of God, which was an holiness church. You know, it's more of a Jamaican church, but it's an holiness church. I would go and worship there just to refresh my soul. During the week, there was nothing. During the week, every day, I carry my Bible. I go and evangelize. Thorough, real evangelism alone. I remember, you know, I met a lot of people among students. You know, I started evangelizing among MSc students, PhD students, people around, around where I was living. And that's how people got converted. In fact, my first two converts at that time were people from Uganda, Cosmos Muyunda, some were Muziri, and then later other people. And that's how eventually we started. And I remember I got to England 1988 in September. In December of that year, there was a Deeper Life Conference. I was the only person that went to the Deeper Life Conference from Manchester. Now, because the pastor knew me, he gave me a message. The message I preached at that conference was holiness and evangelism. I preached the message with all my heart. But during the message, I told the brethren that I'm the only one that have come from Manchester. But next year, December conference, I'm not coming alone. You will see us coming. Some yeah. people are laughing. It's like this guy doesn't know. He's just a JJC. He's only three months in England. He doesn't know how England is tough. But well, brethren, December 1989, when we had the conference, one year later, we went with a luxurious bus from Manchester. Because by that time, by that time, I started Bible study. The Bible study has started growing. We have started Sunday worship. The stop Sunday worship has started growing. We went with a luxurious bus from Manchester. People were, were shocked. That's how. The church started. Now, I wasn't married at that time. Think about it. I was alone. I got married in 1992. We're talking about 88, 89. I didn't know anybody. Nobody could support me. No person with a deeper life background. I myself alone in Manchester. And I started. We finished in Manchester. We went to Liverpool. We established. We finished from Manchester. I mean, then in Leeds, we established. In uh, others' field, we established. And then one of my I mean, friends came from Nigeria, and then he was in I mean, Birmingham for some time, and I helped him also, supported him. He started in, in Birmingham. Today, Birmingham is a whole region with maybe more than about 14 churches. Today, Manchester is a whole region with more than 10 churches, some of them big, big churches. Liverpool, Massey today is a whole region with churches. Leeds today is a whole region with many churches, only from one effort. I didn't know anybody. And then you are two. Ah, my brother, you are great. Too. Hallelujah. My sister, you are great. Hallelujah. You are two. I was one in an hostile environment. But I did something for God. You will do something for God in Jesus' name. Amen. In some of the places where we are, you are you are three brethren. Sometimes you are husband and wife. You are a majority already. You are not like me. We have. I mean, if you start now, we we already have uh, even uh, Sunday worship on the internet that you can use to already begin to do things. We have Bible study on the internet. 
that can support you initially before eventually things begin on a physical level at your place. In my time, there was nothing like that. No internet, nothing. And from Manchester to London was about 300 kilometers. Am I going to be going to, to London 300 kilometers every, I mean, for Bible study? No, I was alone. But if I did it, what I'm saying is that with technology, with the support, with all the things that we have today, it's much easier and you can do it. So what I'm talking about today, what we are saying already, it's a possibility. And I want, I want you to see yourself, see beyond the little cloud, see beyond your only person, see beyond only two of you, see beyond only three of you, see beyond husband and wife, see a great harvest ahead. You are only a seed. A great harvest is ahead. You're going to have a lot of support. A great harvest is ahead. And I can tell you that. I can tell you that a great harvest is ahead. Amen. Do you know that it was Manchester that bought the first property in England? And then Liverpool bought also. Before I left, in Manchester, we bought about two properties. In Liverpool, we have bought about three properties. Before, eventually, I was sent down here to Italy, and then we continue. And you have seen by God's grace what we have done. When I came, Emilia Romaya, there were only five brethren that I met. There was Pastor Emmanuel. He was not married at that time. Then there was Pastor Gatti and the wife. And then there was another brother, brother Kote, and the wife. I think he has gone back to Ghana. Those were the only five people that I met in Moderna Church. There was no money in the church. We couldn't rent a place. So eventually, we got an abandoned house somewhere where no window, no door, nothing, but near to where the, the, the pastor was working. That's what we commanded to start Bible study. So they would hold lantern in the evening, they will hold lantern for me to be able to read my Bible, not for them to read their own Bible, for me to read Bible so that I can do Bible study for them. And if you want to, to ease yourself, you just go into the bush. That's how we started. But today, Emilia Romagna is the biggest region in Italy with so many churches, more than 10 churches. My brethren, see the harvest coming. Little cloud, Great train is ahead. Amen. Little cloud is a little clue. Amen. Your only person there, you are a seed. See the harvest coming. Two Amen. of you there, you are seeds. See the harvest coming. Amen. Three of you there, see the seed. The harvest is coming. If Amen. I did it, if God helped me, that same God is still the same God. Amen. That same Jesus is still the same Jesus. That same gospel is still the same gospel. That same grace is still the same grace. Amen. If God with God, with the grace, with the gospel, I was able to do it. You can do it. Amen. Amen. Do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we looked at that message, seeing beyond the little cloud. Today, we are looking at the message, the church in the house. And the, the outline is on the chat. You can download it so that you can be able to benefit from it. The outline is on the chat. Download it and use it. The, uh, the church in the house. The church, what is the church? The church is not a building. The church is a people. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we are meeting now. This is a cloud. But we are the church. Because the church is not the physical building. The church is not Zoom. The church consists of the people. God's people. So we are the called out people of God, called out of sin, called, called out of corruption, called out of the world, and separated unto God. And the church is called the ecclesia. The church constitutes the people of God. The early church in its infancy, they had no infrastructure, just like we are starting now. And in many places, we don't have infrastructure. And they didn't have resources. Because of that, they often met in people's houses. And therefore, 
we have the popular term, the church in their house, which we will see later, to see that it's a practicable concept, the church in their house. Can you look up? When we started in Manchester, I was the only one. I remember at that time, when I go to, when I write Bible study outline, I was writing Bible study outline by myself, but computers were very expensive at that time. So I would take the Bible study outline. There was a secretary in our department who used to help me. She would type that for me. I pay her for it from my scholarship money. Then it was in the years, not in the years of photocopying. Photocopying has not, been, has not come out. It was cyclostyling. Psycho so she would type on the stencil. Then I would take that to the, the um, student union building where there is a cyclostyling office. So they would cyclostyle, cyclostyle the uh, copies for me and I would pay. So it was, and I remember at that time it was costing me about almost 12 pounds every week. I think about 1988, 1989, 12 pounds every week. That was a lot of money at that time. And I was paying it. Because we're not collecting any data, we have just started. So I didn't have enough money even to rent any place. So we started in my flat. Bible study was in my flat. And it was because of that, I didn't think I, I took a flat by myself so that nobody would say, Well, we are sharing this flat, you can't do Bible study. I wanted to work for God. It was not convenient, but I did. It was a three bedroom flat. And I stayed in it alone, just because it has a living room that I can use for Bible study. It didn't matter. And it was not that the church was supporting me. I, I had no support from the church. It's not that maybe London was sending money. No, I had no support from the church. It was all from me. I would do that. So we started Bible study, one person, then two persons, then three persons. Then eventually, even before I started Bible study, the seats in my house, I bought some more seats, eventually with the seats in the dining and co. Everything was about 17 seats. And we started. I remember the first Bible study, nobody showed up. First Bible study, nobody showed up. And after, the, after I, I prepared, I did everything. After that, oh, what did I do? I lay my hands on every seat, you seat. In the name of Jesus, somebody will sit on you. You sit. I lay my hands on you. Somebody will sit on you. You sit. I lay my hands on you. Somebody will sit on you. And I lay my hands on the 17 seats that somebody will sit on you. <clears throat> and then when I finish praying and I truly finish that, I went out again for evangelism. And when people ask me, how was the Bible study? It was great. I say, what? But this Bible study didn't take place. Oh. The Bible study took place. Me and the Holy Ghost, we were there. Amen. 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 I was there and God was there. Who told you the Bible study didn't take place? God was there and I was present. I told them the Bible study was great. The following week, one person showed up. I did the Bible study. The third week, nobody showed up again. The fourth week, two other people showed up. We took there with me, making three. And that was the last time that we had the least number, three. From that moment on, it was all. Do you know that by the time we left that place, that my flat, the last Bible study is so memorable. 17 people sat down on the 17 chairs. 17 people stood up and I stood up to preach. We were 35. The last Bible study in that place, in that my flat, it was congested. So it can be done. So if you see so many churches in the north of England, it started from that house. It started from that place. I didn't we didn't have money, but we have a place. The church in the house, the early church, 
They had no money. Many of them were poor. You saw what they did in Isaac Tattoo, that they were the people who had some resources, they were bringing everything, putting it into the apostles so that the uh, apostles feed, so that distribution could be given to people because there was poverty. You saw in Acts chapter 6 that some people were complaining that they were neglected in daily ministration. There was no money. Even if there were venues they could rent, they didn't have money. So what did they do? They met in the houses. The church moved on because the church is God's people. The church is not a building. And don't let people tell you that's the church. You are the church. I am the church. We Amen. are the church. Amen. The church is a people. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus Christ said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. What did he say? Amen. 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 He didn't say where they are gathered though. Whether you gather together in the cemetery, you are God's people. Whether you gather together and it's a, 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 a place that they normally use for a bar, but when it is free, you rent it. You are the God's people, not the location. Yeah. Wherever you gather, where two or three are gathered, where are they gathered? He didn't mention where they are gathered. Mm -hmm. he's, he's concerned about the two or three that are gathering in his name. That's the church. So you constitute the church. We constitute the church. So we need to understand that. In today's affluent and more normal society, more formal society, it sometimes feels odd to run churches in people's homes. People say, well, since we are not a secret call, how can we be starting church in the home? No, oh, there is nothing wrong about it. It's a kind of a mentality that people want to put in our brain. No, let's go back to the Bible. And we're going to see today. That's important. However, this phenomenon, is not limited to churches. You know, even multi-billion business enterprises started in humble places. Can you look up? Today, can you look up? Today, Apple as a company is worth more than $2 trillion. It's the biggest company in the world today. $2 trillion. But you need to understand that Steve Jobs and the uh, his colleague, his partner, when they started Apple, they started in a garage. They couldn't afford anything. They couldn't afford an office. Apple started in a garage, not even in the bedroom, not even in a garage. That's important. Hewlett Packard, Hewlett Packard was started, you know, even the name of that HP, Hewlett Packard. One of the partners is called Hewlett. The other one is called David Packard. So it's their surnames that they joined together to, to form Hewlett Packard. They started in a garage. They couldn't, but today, Hewlett Packard employs more than 100,000 people with prestigious offices all over the world. But they didn't start with prestigious offices. They started in the garage. That is important, my brethren. You are seeing them very, very, you know, uh, flamboyant today, they, they look like uh, a companies that is uh, that are enviable. They had humble beginnings. They started in garages. Garages. You, you can read the story. So it's not limited to church alone. Even big organizations, they started in humble beginnings because they didn't have money. What are they going to do? Go and read the story of Facebook. Facebook started, you know, wherever they could get things. That's how they started. And I've told you the story. You know, there was a time they hired some premises just to beautify the premises and make it a little bit comfortable. They called in an artist to paint and to draw and to do things for them. Then when the guy finished, they were to pay him maybe, maybe $10,000 and go. The person said he doesn't want the money. They should give him some shares in Facebook. That's somebody who could see beyond the obvious. That's somebody who could see beyond tomorrow. That's somebody who could see the little cloud bringing the great, the great rain. So instead of paying him about $10,000, $15,000 for the work he has done, they gave him shares in Facebook. When Facebook listed, those shares were worth $200 million. You can Google it. I'm not telling you stories that you cannot cross-check. 
Those shares were worth $200 million, not 20 million, not 2 million, $200 million for helping them to paint you know, their surroundings, just to make life easy for them, just to find some comfort in their, you know, in their drudgery. So Facebook is a multi-billion company today. Yes, they didn't start like that. Too. They started in the doldrums. There was a time they were looking for money that somebody gave them half a million dollars, $500,000, Peter Thiel, for Facebook not to run aground. When Facebook listed, his shares for that $500,000 was, was worth more than $1 billion. He has been a billionaire as a result of his investment in, in Facebook. But how much? $500,000. So these big, big companies, they didn't start like that. They started in humble beginnings. So don't let anything, amen, amen. Or intimidate you. You know, when I was in Manchester, people wanted to intimidate me at that time. In fact, some people said, who gave you the authority to start Bible study? Why are you starting Bible study? Some established churches some established organizations. And I told them, I don't need the authority. Who gave you the authority? I, one of them said, who gave you the authority? I said, God. I said, how do I know? I said, if you're a child of God, you ask him. He will tell you. He was asking me, how do I know that God gave you the authority? I said, you ask God. If you know how to hear from God, he will tell you. And even though I was young, nobody could intimidate me. But look at what has happened today. You have myriads of churches, souls that have been impacted as a result. And I'm telling you, as we are starting, we are going to replicate the same. Amen. Come down with us, we will Amen. do you good. Amen. Come down with us, something great is starting. Amen. Amen. We still know the same thing, we still have the same strategy, we are still going to the same, and by the grace of God, something great is happening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's look at the first point, the concept of gathering, the concept of gathering. The church, as called ecclesia, is a called out people. They are never meant to remain scattered as isolated entities. If you look at all the terms that have been used for the church in the scriptures, they suggest the idea of togetherness. The church is called a body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, we are a body. The eye cannot say to the, to the nose, I don't have need of you. The head cannot say to the leg, I don't have need of you. You need to go somewhere. It is the leg that will carry you there. When you get there, you want to sit down. Leg doesn't sit down. It is your bottom that sits down. You need to eat. It is the mouth that will eat. The leg cannot do anything in that eating. It must stay. Good. It's your hand that you use to mold the semo and put it in your mouth. But every member of the body, they are together to function together. They are together to be able to, you know, to, to, to help one another. Our functions may be different, but it's a body. It's a togetherness. And the Bible uses that illustration for the body of Christ. Your nose and your eyes, if they are not together, how do they function? They must be together. The body is one. So as you begin to understand the concept that has been, you know, the concept that is used for the church, you will see that togetherness in there. You know, Jesus said, I am the shepherd. What do you know about the shepherd? A shepherd is the shepherd of a flock. What do you know about a flock? Togetherness. You don't see one sheep here and another sheep 10 miles away, another sheep 20 miles away. The sheep they are in a flock. They, they join together. And we are the father's flock. So you see that togetherness. The Bible talks about us being soldiers. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about the church as an army. Uh, an army consists of various components. We call them soldiers. A soldier cannot form an army. A soldier cannot exist and be effective alone. A soldier must operate with other soldiers to be able to work. And the church is referred to as an army. The church is referred to as a family. You know, the Bible says we are the household of God. You know, in the family, 
you have the father, you have the mother, you have the children, and they bond together to run that unit. It's a tightly, you know, knit unit. And everybody supplies, you know, the social welfare, you know, the emotional support and everything. We are together in the family. So that's the church again. It's called a family, the family of God. The church is referred to as a temple. And each one of us, we are building stones in that temple. We are stones building blocks in that temple. So as you see all the terms that have been used for the church, what you come to realize is that these are terms talking about togetherness. And I pray that the Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. In Matthew, yeah. 12, Matthew chapter 12, in verse 30, what did Jesus say? And if we are going to be together, the question is together with who? That's important. Together with who? Who else is in that togetherness? Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. It says, he that is not with me is against me. Mm. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth mm -hmm. the Lord. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. You either gather with Jesus or you scatter abroad. There is no one leg in and one leg out. There is nothing like that. You are either in or you are out. You are either with Jesus or you are not with Jesus. And as we gather together with Jesus, then he owns that gathering. Matthew chapter 18 in verse 20. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. They are not gathered together for political reason. They are not gathered together for towns meeting. They are not gathered together to discuss social issues. They are not gathered together to be able to see how they are going to protest against the government. We are never, it says, or where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. They are gathered together in Jesus' name. They are gathered together for God's business. They are gathered together for God's worship. Jesus said, I will be there. I'm in their midst. So when we gather together, we are not alone. Jesus is present. And you need to understand that concept of gathering together. Christ speaks of gathering together with him. He assured us that where two or three are gathered together in his name, that place, that gathering will be graced with his presence. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. You know, even in the early church, some people were already absenting themselves from the gathering together of the believers. And the apostle had to say, don't join that example. Don't join that crowd. Be different. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So some people are already absenting themselves and say, well, the most important thing is that I know Jesus. The most important thing is that I worship my God. I can worship my God in my heart. That's what matters. Paul says, no, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching, the more we are getting close to the rapture, the ones, more we are getting close to the end of the age, it's even much more relevant. Fellowship becomes more relevant to encourage one another, to support one another, to pray for one another much more relevant because the world is becoming more toxic by the day. And I pray that the Lord himself, he will help every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
don't be party to people that are absenting themselves from fellowship. You don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are encouraged not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's part of the Christian journey. Gathering together in Christ, in Christian fellowship and worship is therefore fundamental to the concept of being a church. The early church practiced this fervently. Let's look at Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. I'm simplifying the message so you know, that we get the 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 fifth part of it. Acts chapter two from verse forty one. Then they that godly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. Where is their cathedral? They didn't have any cathedral. They didn't have money. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And if you read on, you, you will see, you know, in verse 47, uh, verse 46, the Bible says, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house. When time afforded them, they could fellowship in the temple because the temple was there. But remember, it was not a Christian temple, it was a Jewish temple. But at the hour of prayer, they also would go there to go and pray. But how, the temp, how do you accommodate 3,000 people from all over Jerusalem and from all over the places? They broke bread. They, at fellowship from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. People were being saved daily. The houses provided a place of fellowship, a place of comfort, a place of support. So we can start in the house. People life started in a house on in uni life. In the pastor's, uh, you know, the flat that the university gave to him as a lecturer, flat 12. That's where people life started. In that flat. It's a big church today. Yes, we have so many churches today. Yes, but it started in a flat. It started in a house before. They outgrew the house and then moved, moved out, you know, to go and find a place. And then got a place with, I think, Redeem, you know, at that time, used the Redeem Church as a, a Bible study location. But it started in the house. First Corinthians chapter 16. So we must not feel caged. Where we are, we must not feel caged. It's right, it's okay to start in the house. It's okay. There is nothing wrong about it. A church is a church. Don't let them tell you, uh, is it a cult? Why are you starting in the house? It's just tactics of intimidation. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse one. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered it, that there be no gathering when I come. You know, here the churches were meeting. And many times they were meeting in people's houses, which you eventually see. So there was a constant fellowship. And among us also, there was constant fellowship. Thank God yeah. because technology is making things easy. You know, without this technology today, what would have happened? You know, a pastor in Valencia, you know, thousands of miles away, how could we have worshipped together? Our, broad, our brethren from Sweden, thousands of miles away, how could we have, I mean, worshipped together? Our brethren from Scotland, thousands of miles away. But today, technology is making life so easy that even though we are separated by distance, we can still fellowship together. And we should take advantage of that and use it 
for the benefit of the kingdom and the edification of ourselves. So number one, the concept of gathering. The church is meant to gather. Now, number two, the centers of gathering. The question is, okay, we are meant to gather. Where can we gather? Oh, this is a gathering. This is a virtual gathering. Then you can have a real physical gathering. It's still a gathering. Now, Christ spoke of gathering together with him and in his name without specifying the specific places or the specific place where we are to gather together. He said, where two or three are gathered together? Where? He didn't mention the specific place. He just said, anytime, anyhow, when you gather together, uh, look at it sometimes. Can you look up? Some medical doctors, some nurses, some hospital workers, sometimes they have hospital fellowship. During their break, they meet together, they pray together. In universities, some staff and uh, you know administrative staff that are Christians, sometimes during lunchtime, they meet together, they have staff fellowship. It's still a church. One is meeting in the university, one is meeting in the hospital, but it doesn't matter. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. In the scriptures, people gathered for worship in all sorts of places. Number one, purposely build synagogues and temples. People worship there. In Luke chapter four, Luke chapter four. So where there are established religious structures, yes, we should, we should, we should make, a, we should take advantage of them. Luke chapter four, in verse sixteen, the Bible says, "And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, I want you to see that, as his custom was, regular practice, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read." He went to go and worship in the synagogue on the Sabbath. That's a religious building, specifically built for the worship of God. It's, it was available. He worshiped there. But how about in other places where Jesus went, where there was no temple? He still worshiped. And we're going to see that in Acts chapter 3. So where can we worship? Number one, in specified, purposely built, religious, you know, uh, establishments built purposely for worship. You can fellowship there. Chapter, Acts chapter three, verse one. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the night hour. That was 3 p.m. You know, the Jews prayed many times a day according to the Torah, the Jewish law. So 3 p.m. was a set time for prayer. They went there also to go and pray. This is the temple. You need to understand that the temple is different from the synagogue, but both are, you have only one temple, you have many synagogues. Only one temple in Jerusalem, only one temple in the entire nation, only one temple in Jerusalem. But there are many synagogues, even in Jerusalem and in other cities. So synagogues are many, only one temple, but they are religious buildings, built purpose, 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 I mean, purpose built buildings for worship, the fellowship there. Number two, open places for large crowds. When we do open air crusade, it's still worship. You gather thousands of people, there is even no building that can contain them. It's still, aren't we gathered in, 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 in Jesus' name? Yes, when Rina Bonke does a crusade and it's 250,000 people, whether in a stadium, whether in, a, in an open place and they build tents, it's still worship. And did Jesus do that? Of course. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. From verse 13, the Bible says, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by sheep into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. 
And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, you know, service in a desert place, outside city, in an open place where crowds could gather, Jesus did that. And today, evangelists are still doing that, packing people in locations where, when they cannot get a suitable location, they pack people in locations where they can do crusade. So we still worship open place for large crowds. Number two, by the seaside, by the riverside. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. You remember, Paul had a vision. And the vision, he saw a man in a vision come over to Macedonia and help us. Acts chapter 16 in verse in verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. When he saw the vision, it was a man that was calling Paul, Come and help us. But what happened? By the time Paul got to Macedonia, look at what happened in verse 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by what? By the riverside. The riverside. Where prayer was one to be made. Can you pray by the riverside? Of course. It's a place you can worship anywhere. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted to that. Did you see a man there? No. But Paul saw in the vision a man that said, Come over to Macedonia and help us. But when he got there, only women came. He didn't say, ah, I didn't see well. You saw well. He didn't mean a man is going to meet you. What he's saying is that there are souls to be rescued in that place. And women are souls also. So in places where our sisters, maybe the brothers are reluctant, they don't want to move, you know, people are pressurizing them, and you are only sisters, we move ahead. Here was Paul. Out of this meeting, God raised up Deborah. I mean, God raised up Lydia. And eventually, this is how this region of Macedonia, this is how the church in Philippi, Philippi was actually the capital of Macedonia. This is how Thessalonica is a city in Macedonia region. This is how Berea. But this was the start of that church. Only women came out. And Paul said, we spoke to them. We prayed. So our sisters, wherever you are, the only sisters where you are, it doesn't matter. We are starting anyway. We are moving ahead. You are a force to reckon with. If Paul started with women, and eventually out of that move of God, came out a church in Philippi, came out a church in Thessalonica, came out a church in Berea, Churches will come out of that same movement in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You must not be intimidated. So, by the riverside, they gathered, worship, Luke chapter 5. Because somebody can say, well, that's Paul. But what did Jesus do? Luke chapter 5. It's not the place where we meet that matters. It is the people. We are the church. We are the church. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret, by the sea, by the lakeside. And I saw two sheep standing by the lake, for the fishermen were gone out of them and was washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Can you see that? He sat in the, he sat in the boat. They roared a little bit off. And then from there, he spoke to the people. This is by the next side. So my brethren, where we are worshiping is not the issue. Who is worshiping is what matters. You and me, we are the church. Where we take the church to is not relevant. Desert place, praise God. Riverside, praise God. 
Sea side, praise God. Amen. Lake side, praise God. Amen. In a restaurant, praise God. Amen. No, it's not relevant. In, in Mark chapter, in Mark chapter two, let's see another place where they gather. Mark chapter two. So we must not allow the mentality of the world to cripple us in our move for God. Mark chapter two, verse one. Again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. We are in the house. They gathered together for Jesus, with Jesus, and he taught them in the house. Remember, that was the house that the friends of the man that was paralyzed, they couldn't get access to Jesus. They had to go to the roof, you know, uncover the roof and lower the man down from the roof. It was a house. It was not a temple. No. It was not a synagogue. No. It was a house. And Jesus taught from that house. Look at Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. In the early church, Acts chapter 12. You know, this message is to strengthen us, to strengthen our confidence so that as we start even in the house, anybody, you, you feel comfortable. Nobody should make you to feel uncomfortable. Acts chapter 12. Look at verse, from verse 5. The Bible says, Acts chapter 12, from verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. These people were praying for Peter, who was in prison. But the question is, where were these people praying? Look at from verse 12. And when he had considered the, the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose son name was Mark, where many were gathered together doing what? Praying. 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 You remember John Mark? Mark. You call him Mark for short in the Bible, but it's John Mark. It was John Mark's mother's house where they gathered. That was where they were having fellowship. That was where they prayed until God released Peter from prison. It was a house. It was a woman's house. John Mark's mother's house. This is Acts of the Apostles. Power was moving. But there was poverty. They couldn't build. They couldn't rent. Worship should start. Too. Whether Amen. we have to rent a place or not, worship starts. Amen? Amen. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whether we have money to rent a place or not, worship continues. That's not what, what is going to determine whether we worship or not. What determines whether we worship, we are the church. Wherever we gather, God is there and we move on. And you can see here, they gathered in the house of John Mark's mother and they prayed until deliverance was granted the apostle. Ah, we will gather in houses, we will pray. Revival Amen. will break out. Amen. 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 That's with comfort. Amen. Amen. Great truth will be experienced in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So these were places where they met, centers of gathering, purposely built synagogues and temple, open places for large crowds, seaside, riverside, lakeside, private houses, they met. It is instructive to know that Israel continued to worship. Let me show you that, Ezra chapter three, because somebody may say, well, maybe pastor is just trying to use this one to encourage us. My sister, is not an encouragement. We are following Bible. Amen. 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 One brother, I say, well, pastor is just using this one to just boost us up. This is not just a booster. We are following Bible. Amen. Ezra chapter 3. You know, during the time of Ezra, remember that Israel had been in captivity. 
Remember that the temple had been raised down, destroyed, and they were coming back to come and restore the worship of God. And in Ezra chapter 3, you will see great worship there. But what I want to show you is one thing. Look at it, verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not was yet not laid. Yet. They want to rebuild the temple, but worship was already going on. They are not going to wait and say, okay, and when we finish building the temple, then we will worship. No, 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 no. God's worship cannot wait until we build the temple. The foundation of the temple has not even been laid. Not to talk about building the temple, but worship was already going on. They knew that they were the people of God. They knew that worship is not dependent on the place of worship. It's dependent on the people who worship. Worship depends on us. We can worship anywhere. Amen. And that worship will be accepted. Amen. Amen. We can Amen. worship in the house. God will accept the worship. Amen. We can worship at the riverside. God will accept the worship. I remember many years ago when we started in Padova. The brethren, all the brethren were, they couldn't rent houses by themselves. So sometimes they are living in a three bedroom flat, but somebody is in one room, another person in another room, another person in another room. They, they will share the rent. And those unbelievers will not allow us to use the living room because they say, well, this is not, not your house. Unless we agree, you can't. And I told the brethren, you cannot fight with them. You know what we did? We started Bible study in the public park, public garden. Have you seen the, the commandment that says, thou shalt not have Bible study in Italian public park? There's no, there's no, there's no law that says that. To, that's how we started. I just told the brethren, before it is too dark, gather yourself together. You know, you have the outline. You know, share together. It's the word of God. Sing choruses, worship, and move on. That's how Veneto started. We started in a public park because we couldn't get a building. We didn't have money to rent. The brethren were poor. But that doesn't mean that worship should stop. We started because the church is not the place. The church is the people. And how we start is not relevant. We are going to start anyway. Amen. We are going to start anyhow. Amen. Amen. And the Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today, you need to you know, change your mentality. So like here, it is instructive to know that Israel continued to worship even when the temple had not been built. Even when they have not even laid the foundation of the temple, worship continued. The early church engaged in worship in private homes when public structures had not been built. The early church in its infancy, they ran churches in private homes. Hence, the concept, the church in their house. Let's look at that. First Corinthians chapter 16. You remember, I've already read First Corinthians chapter 16 to you, when Paul said, when you gather together, upon the first day of the week. But the question is, where were they gathering? In that first Corinthians chapter 16. Look at first Corinthians chapter 16. Let me read to you verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. With the church that in their house. In their house. With the church that is, is in, in their, their house. house. In their house. For Priscilla and Aquila, husband and wife, they ran the church in their own house. And Paul was saying, the brethren from that place, they are sending their greetings. Church in their house. In Romans chapter 16, verse 5. Romans chapter 16. So if they did it in the Bible, we shouldn't be. And, and when we started, I, I didn't feel any, you know, any inferior that we are meeting in a flat. So what? Romans chapter 16, verse 15, verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved Epaminondas, who is the first fruits of attire unto Christ. So you can see there again the church in their house. 
Now, I've read chapter 12 to you, how they were fellowshipping in the house. In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, see what Paul said. Where did Paul teach people? He will show you. Fellowship went on a lot. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and I have taught you publicly. And how? And house, 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 house. House. To house. Anywhere there can be fellowship, Paul was in for it. And he did. And those brethren, they enjoyed. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Salute the brethren that are in Laodicea and Nymphas and the church which is in the house. That's another person, Nymphas. Paul referred to the church in his house, in Nymphas' house. That was the location where they were meeting. So we need to understand that. So today, we must not let physical infrastructure hinder the worship of the church where you are. Don't let physical infrastructure hinder you. If we can get a place that is affordable, we get a place. <laughs> if we cannot get a place, let's start. Let's start immediately in 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 the house. It doesn't matter. We start in the house. Don't feel awkward. This is Bible. This is scriptures. Invite people, two, three, four, like I told you, in my flat, we continue until we are even 35. Okay, Europe may be, uh -uh. If Manchester was Europe. We, we didn't make noise to disturb uh, the neighbors. And I was living in a block of flats. So it's not that maybe I was living in a villa, it was a block of flat, but we make sure that what we are doing did not disturb the next door neighbor, the next door neighbor. They never complained throughout, never one day any complaint. We didn't disturb them. We were not beating band and we, we did things modestly. We were not making noise. We just came, sang modestly, you know, prayed modestly, listened to the word of God. No noise to the neighbors. We were able to move on. And the Lord can do the same thing in your life. Amen. 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 He will do the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We must not let physical infrastructure hinder the worship of God. And don't let people tell you that it cannot be done. People life today started in a flat. Flat 12. Manchester, we started, whatever is there now in the UK, it started in the house. The bulk of the north of England, at least you can talk about, started in my flat. As small as it is, that's where you know, we got people who were sent. I mean, the people, Sister Kate, Sister Bola, and I've forgotten the third person now, that were sending to, to, to Leeds to help to establish the church in Leeds. They started in my house. They were born again, they were converted when we were still doing the Bible study in my house. Later, we sent them to go and plant, you know, church. You know, all the people that were regional overseers now, over all those regions. Most, most of them were converted in that flat. Today now they are region overseers together with their wives. But they were converted in that fellowship started in that house. I still remember the address, number 38. You no, know, Hulldale Close, Hume in Manchester. How can I forget the address? Oh, great things happen. Even though that building has been pulled down, they've, you know, they built it, and it was a rough area, you know, because, you know, as a student, can I afford a very pushy area? No, I could only afford a rough area as a student because the rent would be cheap. But rough or not, the church was meeting. Amen. Today, the church has a lot of buildings, but we started in those humble beginnings when we couldn't afford anything. My brethren, we are going to start in houses. Amen. And the faith of them will not prevail against us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. They are not going to make us to feel inferior and say, look at this backyard thing. Every church started like a backyard. 
they may be great and prestigious today. They started in Ibatia. Go and read the history of any church. They started in houses. That's how it happened. The better this church today. John Wesley used to go and preach on his father's grave. And you know, because the English, you know, because they would stone them everywhere. And because the English respect cemetery, they respect grave. They, they may stone you to death, who is alive, but they will never touch grave. You know, they, 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 they so respect. So John Wesley will stand on his father's grave. You know, they cannot stone him there. He will preach. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, if you read church history, if you read church history, it will surprise you what people have done. Churches are great today, yes, but they have an history. They have an history. And we are starting today. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Amen. And as we're going to start, you remember, oh, yes, church. Maybe there was a time we broke the yes, church where we couldn't afford. We broke them into churches. Milan church. Maybe we broke Milan Church into, into house fellowships and we started in houses. Brescia Church. We started in the house of Brother Asari many years ago. I would go from Rome to Brescia to go and preach. We started in Brother Asari's house. That's where we met. We didn't start, you know, uh, as a church. No. Now it's a big church now. We have Brescia Church, we have Rodrigo Church and go. But we started in a house. Even Milan Church, before we got a building and co, we started in Pastor Paul's house. So it is important. Most of these places, they started as churches in the house. And then as brethren are now coming, we become two, we become three, we become four, we become five, we become six, we become seven, we become 10. And now, you know, the place is getting congested. By the grace of God, people are getting a little bit committed. Now we have some little resources that we can rent a place and it's adequate. Then we move out. But we start. If we never start, if we see the first thing is we are looking for a building, we may never start. We may never start. We start anyhow. And by the grace of God, we will do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do we run churches in the house sometimes? Number one, inability to sustain rent payments. You know? in rented properties. Sometimes, even we may be many. Milan, when we split up Milan into houses, Milan church was about 55, but we couldn't afford, we were struggling. We couldn't afford paying the rent. And are we going to be mounting up rent upon rent upon rent upon rent? And let's go back and, and, and you know, replan. Then we broke into houses because we couldn't afford it. When the landlord, Increase the rent from 500 euro to 800 euro in Ancona. Already at 500 euro, we were, I mean, yes, at 500 euro, we were struggling. Rome was paying, we were struggling. Not that an offering was coming as such. When they increased it to 800, I told them, Rome cannot cope with that money, it's too much. Eventually, they split into house fellowships. Eventually, before it, it's important. How did we start in Pesaro? I remember that it was in the house of one brother. One brother in Pesaro that the church in Pesaro started. Today, the church in Pesaro does not only, I mean, have a, have a building, we've bought a building there, but we didn't start with buying the building. We started in somebody's house many years ago. We gathered in somebody's living room many years ago. Then we can say now we, we've bought a cinema, we now have a job. We thank God progress has been made. But that's not where we started. But if we never start in that house, we will not be anywhere today. So where you are, my brother, where you are, my sisters, we are going to start. Amen. I can't hear your amen. 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 I need to hear a resounding amen. 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 We start and we will go forward and the Lord will prosper the work in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Those are the centers of, of gathering. Number two, there are even times that you even have money. You don't have available premises. What are you going to do? There are times you have the money, but even suitable buildings are not available. What are you going to do? You have to still do something and just move on and uh, 
and just have the fellowship anyhow. And by God's grace, believing God that, you know, locations will eventually be available. So that's important. Those are some of the reasons that we do. Now, what are the conquests through gathering as we gather together? Coming together and gathering together as a church brings a lot of triumph, a lot of conquest and dominion, irrespective of where we gather. The Bible says that Jesus preached the word unto them. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. There will be freedom. People will get saved. There are many people that got saved in the house. Like I told you, where we started the Bible study in Manchester, many people got saved. Many of those people became workers in the church, became, you know, pillars in the church. Even after I came to, to, to Italy, for many, many of them are still in the church, leaders in the church, helping the church. But they got saved in that Bible study that we started. So a lot of triumphs will be, will, will, will be made. Healing and deliverance through anointed administration. Oh, can I tell you a lot of testimonies? When we were still even less than 10 in that Bible study, somebody came and said, my brother has been put on you know, death row. They're going to execute him. He's in Kirikiri. After Bible study, I prayed with that sister. One week later, that brother was released. Wow. We said, wow. Well, it's just God in compassion. Amen. We recorded a lot of miracles in that place. Another person, the husband was sent to prison for pushing drugs, you know, and it was an indefinite, you know, sometimes when they sentence somebody to prison, they sentence you and say, okay, 10 years, five years. At least you know that after five years, you will come out. This one was indefinite. They just threw him into prison. No, it's not that he's going to spend five years. Indefinite, as long as, in fact, that, that, that saddened them all the more. She came to church and I said, well, when your husband comes out of prison, he needs to give his life to Christ. But we are going to pray and the Lord will intervene. We prayed, two weeks later, he was released. The woman was shocked. What you said, God did wonderful, wonderful things. And as we start in those houses, God is going to do wonderful, wonderful things. Amen. Amen. Breakthroughs are going to come. Amen. A lot of triumphs are going to come. Amen. A lot of conquests are going to be won. Amen. And the Lord will do great things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, empowering what that sets free will be received. Healing and deliverance through the anointed ministration will take place. Encouragement and inspiration based on mutual faith will come. Let, let, let's, let's finish with that Romans chapter 1, verse 12. You know, as we, as we come together in those houses, as we come together ministering to one another, look at what will happen. Romans chapter 1, verse 12, that, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and, and, me. and me. Brethren, as we join together, I join my faith, I join it with your faith. The brethren in that fellowship, they join their faith together. There will be mutual fellowship. There will be mutual comfort. There will be mutual help. There will be mutual conquest. We join together to pray. There will be breakthrough. We join Amen. together to encourage one another. There will be impact. Very important. That, those are the conquests through gathering. So what are we seeing today? The church in the house is a valid concept. It's a scriptural concept. It's a working concept. It's a workable concept. And it's going to work in our time and in our places in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the grace of God, as we are started. Don't worry. We are going to start. You know, in Scotland, we will start. The church in the house. In Kodonyo, we will start. The church in the house. In Sweden, we will start. The church in the house. Amen. We are not going to rent. We are going to rent. We'll be looking. But we don't wait until when, you know, we get a building before we move. The foundation of the temple had not been laid. But in the time of Ezra, worship was going on. Amen. And the same thing is going to happen in our place, in our time. Worship goes on. Yes, we are looking for a place of worship. Worship will go on. 
in Asti, worship will go on. In the places where we are, Ravenna, worship will go on. This is a concept in the scriptures and it's a valid concept. And I pray that the Lord himself he will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, let's rise up and pray and tell the Lord that what we have learned today, we're going to put it into practice. What we have learned today, we're going to put into practice. The church in the house. The church in the house. The church in the house. My boss, we're going to start to go back. You will move in our midst, oh God. You will move your church to go. Your glory will come down. Your and power of God. Let's pray that the Lord is there will help us by the grace of God. But that we do not look at the beginning, but look forward to God. The great things are what we do in our life. Oh, God, I pray for you. I pray for your faith. I pray for your faith. I pray for your living power. What a powerful concept. This we are marching forward. We are marching forward. of prevail. The coaches that we find today, they started in the houses. in Jesus' name, pray. Amen. I'm still going to pray. Do you know that there was a leadership conference? A leader was sent from Nigeria to come and visit us at that time. And we had a leadership conference. It was held in my house, in my house. We cleared my living room and we were by a hundred. You know, my living room is big. Then some people stood outside through the window. We put the pulpit under the, under the staircase going up. You know, that, that space under the staircase. We put the pulpit there. People sat down. We were by a hundred. It held in my house, in my hands. Today the church is big, but, you know, it's important. The church in the house. So anywhere we are, don't let them go say, how can we be meeting in the house? Those are people that are not reading Bible. Those are people that have not seen what has been done. We're going to pray that every kind of negative comment that people are going to make as we start in the houses will affect us. God will empower us. God will, empower us. God will establish his work in the name of Jesus. The Lord will establish his work as we start in those houses. Great things will happen by the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, great things will happen. Great things will happen. Great things will happen. Great things will happen. Because it is your church. It is your church. And will not prevail against be distracted So focus on the work I have. So focus on the achievement I have. All the great nations that will come out of this single point of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, inspire me every moment of the day. Help me to push me forward. 
goodness of heart which beats in our heart. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you, as you have shown us the scriptures and you have shared with us your mind, that our minds will be renewed. Amen. Amen. We will think like Jesus and think like God. Amen. Amen. Looking and hearing what people are saying, we do it the way God wants us to do it and we we'll get results. Amen. Amen. It says that even though your beginning was small, your later end will greatly increase. Amen. We start in the house, but we will end up in the cathedral. Amen. In Pesaro, we started in the house, but today we have ended up in an auditorium that can see 300 that we have bought. But we didn't start there. Oh God, help us to see that every church can take the same step and arrive at the same, same point. And that's Amen. the goal. Amen. Oh Lord, I'm praying that we are going to see beyond today's little cloud. We are Amen. going to see the great harvest ahead. We are going to see great rain coming. We are going to see the great crowd gathering. We are going to see the great churches that Amen. are going to come out of this little thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I pray that you will strengthen your people. Amen. Everybody on this platform, Make them pillars in the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, the churches will be built. Amen. And we will come back in years to come. Amen. The stories of achievement. Amen. Stories of accomplishment to tell. Amen. And we will remember this series that we remember those series when Pastor was helping us to see the concept in the scriptures of little churches starting in the houses. And then we'll be able to tell somebody and say, you, you know, we were only two in our location and we started. Look now, we have a church of a hundred people. We have an auditorium of our own. Who could have believed in those years that this will happen? That will be our story in Jesus' name. Amen. Strengthen the hands of your people. Amen. Empower them for victory. Amen. Lord, open doors in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we start, even if we have to start in the houses, as we invite people, oh Lord, the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he turns it with us wherever he will. It. Meeting in house will not be a barrier to people from coming to worship. Amen. Us Amen. Amen. You will touch their heart. Amen. They will gather with us. And Amen. from there, will be able to move forward in a glorious way in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Lord. Let your name be glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus' mighty and victorious name, I pray. Amen. Amen.